chair, chairpersons, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to present uh, uh, these guidelines that were um, presented and released for the first time at the ESC 2017. These are my conflict of interest, and uh, uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge uh, the, the team that did the work. I had the pleasure to be on board with this task force uh, that were led uh, in a really excellent way by Borja Ibanez from Spain and uh, Stefan James from Sweden. So we try to do it uh, as didactic as possible. We try to implement figures and try to uh, make everything uh, more visual. We know that the uh, younger generation do not like to read as much as we do, and they like to look at figures and, uh, and videos. So we try to make it more uh, visible. So this is the, the management and the timelines in patients with suspected acute myocardial infarction. So what we try to uh, show in this, uh, in this figure is uh, what are uh, the management, the initial management of this patient and what are the, are the timelines that should be respected uh, in patients with suspected acute myocardial infarction. So you have here the patient with uh, chest pain. Then there are three uh, possibilities. Either he calls in the ambulance, this should be the, the case in all the patients, or the patient go by himself directly to a hospital without PCI facility, or he goes himself uh, to a, a center with uh, PCI facilities. What is important is that uh, the time to diagnosis of STEMI should be short, should be less than 10 minutes. Ideally, whether you are in the ambulance and you have uh, somebody who is uh, able to write and interpret an ECG, or you come to the hospital, the ECG in each and every patient we suspected acute myocardial infarction should be done within 10 minutes. So you should have the diagnosis based on clinical symptoms and ECG without 10 minutes, within 10 minutes. So the next question is, what is the time expected for PCI? So if you are able in this patient uh, to uh, deliver a PCI within 120 minutes, either you are in the ambulance or you're in a hospital without PCI facility. So if you are able to transfer the patient and have a PCI uh, within 120 minutes, then primary PCI is recommended. If primary PCI is delivered, then the expected time for uh, wire crossing, for reperfusion, is 90 minutes. So you have 90 minutes time to transfer your patient and to have his vessel open. If the timeline of 120 minutes cannot be uh, matched, then you should do administer fibrinolytic therapy. And to administer fibrinolytic therapy, you have 10 minutes time. So everything goes very fast. If the patient comes in in a PCI center, you do the diagnosis, then you have 60 minute times to open this vessel. What is important is that some of the wording like a door to balloon or door to doors uh, have been eliminated uh, from the guidelines because felt to be ambiguous. And now we have the term STEMI diagnosis. STEMI diagnosis is the time at which the ECG of a patient with ischemic symptoms is interpreted and uh, as presenting with STEMI. So again, this uh, table summarizes uh, the important time targets in the management of patient with uh, STEMI. As I mentioned, the first maximum time from first medical contact to ECG diagnosis in patient suspected with STEMI is 10 minutes. Once the diagnosis is made, the maximum expected delay from STEMI diagnosis to primary PCI, in order to choose primary PCI as a strategy over fibrinolytic therapy, is 120 minutes. So if you cannot match this 120 minutes, then the patient should get fibrinolytic therapy. As mentioned before, if the patient is already in a primary PCI center and the diagnosis of STEMI is made, the timeline is 60 minute maximum to get this vessel open. 
on the other uh, key, um, situation, if the diagnosis is made not in a center with primary PCI facility, then the maximum time to get this vessel open, so transfer the patient and get the vessel open, is 90 minutes. So now, if you have in a case where you cannot deliver primary PCI within 120 minutes, then the patient should get fibrinolytic therapy, as mentioned, and again, the, the maximum delay between diagnosis of STEMI and administration of fibrinolytic therapy is 10 minutes. So once you have administered uh, fibrinolytic therapy, the time delay from starting fibrinolysis to assessing uh, the reperfusion, whether the patient has reperfused or not, is 60 to 90 minutes. And the other important point is independently uh, of even if the patient has a reperfused, which is defined as more than 50% uh, ST segment resolution uh, and absence of, uh, of symptoms uh, within 60 to 90 minutes, you have to transfer the patient. So you administer fibrinolytic therapy, even if it is successful, you have to administer the transfer the patient because this patient will need coronary angiography and, if appropriate, uh, PCI in the two to 24 hours following uh, administration of fibrinolytic therapy. So what is important is that uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, emphasis is put on patient with uh, ECG that might be atypical or might be uninterpretable. And these are patients with uh, bundle branch block, ventricular pacing, hyperacute T waves. This is another um, alternative uh, presentation of, uh, of uh, transmural ischemia at the very early phase. Isolated ST depression interior le anterior leads can be posterior MI or universal ST depression with uh, AVR elevation showing a global ischemia. So if the patient has symptoms, ischemic symptoms, and any of those uh, ECG presentation, then you should embrace a primary PCI strategy, meaning urgent angiography and PCI if indicated. What is also important that in the guidelines, they don't really make a, a difference between a new or presumably new left bundle branch block or both or right bundle branch block. So these are consider equal for recommended urgent angiography if the patient has ongoing ischemic symptoms. Now with respect uh, to the uh, reperfusion strategy, what is the evidence? Uh, uh, the evidence of primary PCI is uh, class 1A, so clearly uh, superior to fibrinolytic therapies as mentioned, if you can administer in within 120 minutes. So no doubt there, class 1A indication. Now, beyond the 12 hours of symptom onset, you have two different uh, um, situations. If the primary, if the patient has ongoing symptoms or hemodynamic instability or are major arrhythmias, independently of the delay from symptom onset, then primary PCI is indicated up to uh, 48 hours. So if the patient has sign of ongoing ischemia, it doesn't matter when the symptoms started, you have to take this patient to the cat lab. What is the, the situation if the patient is beyond 12 hours of symptom onset and is asymptomatic and fully hemodynamic stable? So in this case, the, uh, the guideline suggests uh, a primary PCI between 12 hours and 48 hours this is a 2A indication, should be considered, is a weaker indication because the uh, data for this type of patient is somehow limited. We have BRAVE3 result with a moderate size trial, we have uh, observational studies, but the level of evidence is inferior to the uh, first 12 hours beyond symptom onset. Now, what to do with patients that uh, have presented more than 48 hours after symptom onset. So already they are in the subacute phase of, uh, of uh, uh, STEMI, they present late, and so clearly there is no indication for routine PCI 
in asymptomatic patients if they present beyond 48 hours of, uh, um, of uh, symptom onset. This is was clearly demonstrated in the OAT study that there is no um, benefit. Now, what are the, the techniques uh, in order to treat those patients uh, with respect to infarct-related artery? So stenting is recommended over balloon angioplasty for primary PCI, class one indication. New generation drug eluting stent are recommended over bare metal stent, also clear class 1A indication. And radial access is recommended over femoral access if performed by an experienced radial operator. What is important, and we'll see the detail later on, routine use of thrombus aspiration is not recommended, and routine use of deferred stenting, meaning just open the vessel in the acute phase and maybe two days later or one day later perform stenting, as was uh, um, investigated especially by our French colleague, this is not recommended because it's not superior. So now the question is what to do with the other vessel, not culprit vessel in patient with multivessel disease and STEMI. So uh, the recommendation is that the routine revascularization of significant uh, lesion, non-culprit lesion, should be considered in STEMI patient with multivessel disease before hospital discharge. So r all the vessels should be treated if they are significant, and uh, uh, conservative management of non-culprit lesion is inferior, but it is not clear whether this should be done immediately or this should be done staged. So, but the guidelines tell us this should be done within the hospitalization. With respect to patient cardiogenic shock, uh, this is the exception where we recommend in all the cases to do uh, simultaneous uh, revascularization of all significant lesion in the acute phase. Cabbage is really reserved for patient in whom you cannot open the infant-related artery, and this is really a major vessel. It is early, e uh, very low ischemic time, and especially in patient with multivessel disease. So very little role for cabbage in the acute phase of STEMI. So to go back to patient where you cannot perform primary PCI because you cannot match the 120 minutes delay, so you administer fibrinolytic therapy, as we mentioned. You have 10 minutes to do that. And then what to do? You have administer your fibrinolytic therapy. Then you have 60 to 90 minutes to assess whether the patient has reperfused or not, based on symptoms, based on reduction of ST segment elevation greater than 50%. So if the patient meets the reperfusion criteria, then this patient will undergo routine coronary angiography between 2 and 24 hours following administration of lytics. So you have to transfer all the patient in whom you have administered fibrinolytic therapy because they will need, even if they have reperfusion, an angiogram within two days. But if the patient does not meet the reperfusion criteria, he still has ongoing pain, the, he doesn't have a significant ST segment resolution, then this patient needs to be transferred immediately because he needs rescue PCI. That is an important. The fact of performing routine angiography and if needed revascularization in patient with uh, fibrinolytic therapy, even if successful, is now a class one indication based on several studies that have shown a superiority of the strategy of routine coronary angiography and if required revascularization over selected coronary angiography in patients with successful fibrinolytic therapy. So with respect to fibrinolytic therapy, uh, uh, the fib fibrin specific agent such as tenecteplase, alteplase, reteplase are recommended and what is important is a new recommendation Half dose of tenecteplase should be considered in patients 75 years uh, uh, of age of older. 
And this is based on the STREAM study. STREAM study compared primary PCI of immunity therapy. And in this study, initially, the full dose of tenecteplase was associated with an increased hemorrhagic risk, intracranial bleeding in patients older than 75 years of age. Then the protocol was amended, and in the second phase of the STREAM study, there was no more uh, intracranial bleeding in those patients. So based on this data, half dose of tenecteplase is recommended, should be considered in patients older than 75 years of age. So if you administer fibrinolytic therapy, obviously you have to anticoagulate your patient, and the anticoagulation is recommended in patients with lytic treatment until revascularization if performed, or during the duration of the hospital stay up to eight days. So all this patient needs anticoagulation. You have alternatives, you can give enoxaparin, you can give unfractionated heparin, and enoxaparin is found to be more user-friendly and is preferred over unfractionated heparin. And as already mentioned, the transfer after fibrinolysis is recommended in all patients, even if they have reperfused, because of the reason I told you before. So uh, with respect to uh, um, what to do following fibrinolysis, fibrinolysis, emergency angiography and PCI is recommended in all patients which go in uh, heart failure or shock or have sign of ongoing ischemia. These patients are considered to be failure of fibrinolytic therapy and needs to have a rescue uh, PCI. So with respect to logistical issue for hospital stay, this may also be important in China with a lot of patients that you have, these guidelines try to make uh, your life easier and try to give some guidance when you can transfer back a patient to a non-PCI hospital and when can you discharge uh, low-risk patient uh, uh, following staining. And with respect to transfer back, so you have the patient coming to your center for primary PCI, you are full, you don't have uh, a bad capability, you want to transfer him back. Uh, the guidelines tell you that the same then transfer should be considered appropriate in selected patient after successful primary PCI. So if you have successful primary PCI, you have a patient without complication, without residual ischemia, arrhythmia, without hemodynamic instability, he may have a uh, normal systolic function, moderate or, or discrete reduction in systolic function, no need for mechanical support, no need for other revascularization. This patient can be considered and should be considered for transfer. So this opened the door for you to safely transfer those patients. The other point is uh, um, how early can you discharge a patient with uncomplicated MI? So you have uh, absolute uh, primary PCI was successful, a small MI, uh, maybe normal systolic function, slightly reduced uh, systolic function, no complication at all. The guidelines tell us that you can discharge this patient as early as uh, uh, 48 hours. But it is important that this patient needs to be followed up closely. So you have to have a rehab program for him. You have to have uh, some follow-up consultation in your um, <coughs> outpatient clinic. With respect to cardiogenic shock, cardiogenic shock obviously remains patient very high risk, very problematic. So what I already tell you before, that in patients with multivessel disease, STEMI and cardiogenic shock, you should treat all the vessel immediately at the time of index procedure. You may uh, see that the, the recommendation for uh, inotropic or vasopressor, obviously we give to all those patients inotropic or vasopressor because they are in shock and we don't know what to do. But it's important to realize that the level of recommendation for those uh, um, drugs that we give all the time is very weak. 2BC, virtually there is no data for inotropic or vasopressor in cardiogenic shock. Obviously, we give them to them because uh, we don't know what to do. But uh, the, the level of uh, recommendation is low because there is really actually no data. And the same is true and, uh, for assistance uh, device, so mechanical assistance. We are going moving more from uh, vasopressor, inotropic uh, support to a mechanical support in patients with deep cardiogenic shock 
and STEMI. For example, ECMO, um, uh, peripheral uh, uh, assisted uh, circulation that you can uh, implant also percutaneously in the cat lab. So the level of recommendation remains low because there is no data, but sometimes with extracorporeal circulation, ECMO is the only way you can save those patients. Very important, routine intraortic balloon pumping is not indicated because found to be of no benefit in uh, cardiogenic shock uh, in STEMI. Cardiac arrest is the second population which is very complicated and we don't know really, um, uh, sometimes we are in doubt what is the best uh, uh, appropriate treatment for patient uh, that presented with cardiac arrest. So if the patient presented with cardiac arrest and then come back to normal circulation, if you have ECG uh, with STEMI, then you take it, this patient to the cat lab independently of the condition of the cardiac arrest. And uh, um, obviously, this patient following cardiac arrest should be transferred as soon as possible to a center with a PCI uh, facility. Now, the problem is what to do with patients that have a cardiac arrest and did not, does not have uh, ST segment elevation on the ECG. So the guidelines tell us that if you suspect ongoing ischemia, the patient has a, had a cardiac arrest, recovered, you suspect ongoing myocardial ischemia, you should take this patient to the cat lab even in the absence of ST segment elevation. Obviously, it's sometimes very difficult, we have to admit, to know whether a patient has a yes or no sign of ongoing ischemia, is intubated and things like that. So if the hemodynamic instability, obviously you have to go to the cat lab, sometimes urgent echocardiography help you in telling whether you have systolic dysfunction, but in doubt, uh, the um, guidelines encourage to take this patient to the cat lab. Obviously, the situation of the cardiac arrest plays a role. If the patient has uh, five, 10 minutes of no flow, then you have to consider really if you want to take this patient to the cat lab because unfortunately, his prognosis will be very poor anyway. So uh, we tried in these guidelines to visualize what were the changes compared to previous guidelines. And this is a, like a central illustration that try to give you in one uh, view what changed. So if you are on the left side, you have 2012 recommendation. On the right side, you have 2017 recommendation. You see here the colors. The colors are the, the uh, level of evidence and the class of recommendation. Yellow, class 2A, should be considered. Green, class one recommendation, is recommended. Red is not recommended, and uh, orange is may be considered, class 2B. So you see, for example, radial axis here went from a class 2A to a class 1. Why? Because we had the, the matrix study showing superiority of transradial approach over transfemoral approach in STEMI and non-STEMI, and an associated meta-analysis showing superiority of the transradial approach in acute coronary syndrome for hemorrhagic complication, vascular access complication, and also mortality at 30 days. The second point, drug eluting stent went from a class 2A to a class 1. Now we have superiority of drug eluting stent of newer generation over bare metal stent in STEMI. Just one piece of information here, the examination study showing that not only you have less target revascularization, but overall less ischemic events and even less stent thrombosis with drug eluting stent of newer generation compared to a bare metal one. The complete revascularization went from a class three, don't do it, to a class 2A. So we know from multiple study, PRAMI, DANAMI3, CULPRIT, COMPARE, ACUTE, that is favorable to treat all the lesions that are significant uh, compared to treating the CULPRIT lesion alone in patients with STEMI and uh, multivessel disease. The only thing that remains to be defined is whether you should do it immediately at the time of primary PCI or you should do it um, staged. And the guidelines tell you currently you are free to do what you want, but you should do it within the same hospitalization. Then tr um, uh, thrombus aspiration went from a class 2A should be considered to class 3 because in the meantime 
we have uh, two studies, total and taste, showing no benefit of routine thrombus aspiration in STEMI. Bivalirudin was downgraded from class 1 to class 2C, to a, uh, class 2A, based on two study matrix showing no benefit of bivalirudin over unfractionated heparin, and even heat primary PCI showing a superiority of unfractionated heparin. So downgrading from bivalirudin. Enoxaparin was slightly upgraded based on the ATOL study, moderate size study, and some meta-analysis of observational data, some increase in the value of enoxaparin from 2A to, to from 2B to 2A. Early hospital discharge, now more encouraged, as I told you before, class 2A should be considered in patients with unproblematic uh, uh, acute myocardial infarction. Oxygen therapy is indicated now only in patients with uh, uh, oxygen saturation less than 90%. So you don't have to give oxygen to all the patients, and actually routine administration of oxygen in all the semi-patients is uh, considered class three indication. And as uh, remember, the AVOID study is actually suggested that the oxygen administration in normoxemic patient was uh, deleterious and actually the release of troponin in the oxygen group was higher than in the non-oxygen group. So you should not give oxygen to all your patient with STEMI, but only in patient with are hypoxemic or in ventilatory distress. So we have some additional new recommendation here with respect to uh, lipid lowering therapy. So now there is a class 2A indication should be considered. If you cannot match your target of 1.8 millimol per liter, meaning 70 milligram per deciliter LDL with statin, then you should consider an additional uh, drug in order to reduce it. And this opened the door also for the PCSK9 inhibitor based on Fourier and also in of ezetimibe based on Improvit. So with respect to Canglero, Canglero, a IV P2Y12 inhibitors, only a small indication, class 2B may be considered if the patient is P2Y12 naive based on the uh, champion study. So with respect to prolonged dual antipathetic therapy, extended ticagrelor up to 36 months in high-risk patient following myocardial infarction is recommend, or, or may be considered based on the result of the Pegasus study. And here again, some minor uh, uh, changes also from 2012 to 2017. Uh, the fact of giving uh, morphine, we are now more careful in giving morphine to patients with STEMI because we know that this affects the reabsorption of P2I12 inhibitor. Obviously, if the patient has significant symptoms, it should be relieved. As I told you, the value of hydrotropic vasopressor is quite weak, class 2B, ultrafiltration, also the value is going down, even in patients with volume overload, just minor indication, mechanical support may, may be considered in selected patient, and routine use of intraortic balloon pump was downgraded and is no more recommended. So these are uh, my uh, final slides, ladies and gentlemen. You have your pocket guidelines here translated in, uh, in Chinese, and I want to congratulate uh, the society for being able to translate the, the guidelines in two, two weeks. So they did a great job. So it was just wonderful. So you have uh, the pocket guidelines. You have the uh, app, pocket guidelines app, which is uh, very useful, can also use it. And we really encourage you to come to the ESC 2080 meeting, which will take place in Munich, Germany. And if you unfortunately cannot come, then you should know that you can see all the presentation, you can see all the slides that have been presented at any ESC uh, uh, meeting. And I thank you for your attention.